What is up guys, this is another Monday Night Rewind podcast coming at you once again, going back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars where we cover WWF Raw and WCW Nitro from 1997, and this week we are covering September 29th, 1997 episodes, so it's Raw 227 and Nitro 107. And so, um, before we kick it off, as always, um, obviously you can uh, watch this or listen to it at YouTube at Awesome Nerd Show, where we're located. So you can find the episode each week on either Saturday or Sunday. I hope for shoot for Saturday, but sometimes it comes out on Sunday. Uh, but you can find it on either one of those days each week, or you can find it on iTunes or SoundCloud or Apple Podcast, iTunes, whatever you want to call it. Either one under Monday Night Rewind, you'll see the old classic-looking Raw logo, but it says MNR Podcast. So you can find us there, download it, listen wherever you want on the go then, and not always have to watch through YouTube. But as I said, we're covering Raw 227 to start out with here, and so this took place in Albany, New York, and so this is all leading up to the Bad Blood pay-per-view on Sunday, which for me is a big pay-per-view because it's the first ever Hell in a Cell, and that's, I'm a huge Undertaker fan, like, I've bought cl- all sorts of collections and stuff of matches on The Undertaker, and I love all his matches from the body bag, I can think of what it's called, body bag match, the casket matches, the buried alive matches, the boiler room brawl, the Hell in a Cell, the cage matches, all of, I'm just love all of these matches so of course this is um the first hell in a cell with the undertaker and Shawn michaels and of course we're getting the debut of kane so i assume that'll come in next week in next week's episode um but to start this show off we get a replay of stone cold steve austin uh stunning everyone so replays where he stunned jr jerry the king lawler sergeant slaughter and of course vince from last week which was a big part so just replays through all of those um stunnings or (laughs) if you don't call it and then we kick off the show with Vince McMahon in the ring uh, bringing Shawn Michaels out for an interview and he comes out with uh, DX so all the DX members that there is at that time um, so Vince starts the interview off but first going to Rick Rude who's of course out there you know Vince is asking him who's you know still trying to get who's paying him who's you know Rick Rude there working for and um, Rick Rude just says it's confidential and I forget. Yeah, I think he mentions it then because I don't see it later on. But he's mentioning to Vince, you know, with all the problems Vince has going on in the WWF right now, that um, Vince could probably use him. So if Vince wants to pay up the money, um, he'd be more than happy to do it. But then, so Vince moves on then to Shawn Michaels. And uh, Vince starts off by saying some. Now let's listen to the wise ass of the WWF. So Vince saying that one ass on his own show. And then showing you just where they're at in the whole Attitude Era stuff or whatever. Um, but then uh, Shawn Michaels starts talking and he says, um, you know, just recapping the attack on Undertaker's um or attack on Undertaker from last week. So if you remember that, then they replay the video of it. So Sean's kind of like play by playing on it or whatever. And uh, so the video plays and he's talking. And then Vince moves over to Triple H and Triple H says um, that uh, Vince has always been afraid of clicks. And so, of course, they're referencing the click where she was involved in and the whole curtain call incident and everything that, of course, took effect on him and stuff. And that Triple H said, you know, that he's fine, that he's just, finally tired of watching um, WWF give breaks to less talented wrestlers so that's why he's gonna come out or he's joined you know Shawn Michaels and doing the tactics he's been doing and is just gonna start making his own opportunities and do whatever he wants and so then Sergeant Slaughter ends up coming out after that and so he starts talking to Shawn about the Hell in a Cell and he says that um, he wishes Shawn luck at Hell in a Cell because he's gonna need it and that tonight Hunter Hearst Helmsley will face Undertaker in the main event and of course they all start freaking out or whatever about that and so then Sergeant Slaughter is talking or as Sergeant Slaughter is talking to Shawn Michaels Shawn's of course doing the thing where he's holding his um, European championship up in front of his face like trying to block the spit from Sergeant Slaughter and stuff so again making fun of him for spitting when he talks which then all leads into the Hart Foundation coming out onto the top of the ramp and they uh, you know just like a whole promo thing and they say that um, Shawn and Hunter will pay for their crimes against um, the Hart Foundation which they reference 
the one night or it's in reference to the one night only stuff that happened is the crime that happened and then um that sean and hunter or and after they say that they pretty much just say you're gonna pay for your crimes and then they walk through the curtain again and it goes to the ring when Shawn michaels and hunter doing their oath face like their fake worried face and they're just like like gasping like oh no we're gonna get payback or something like i don't know whatever type of thing and so that ends that whole segment and then we get move on to the um, footage from the one night only so it pretty much like replays the whole after the ending of the match stuff and so it talks about how uh sean michaels put the figure for on british bulldog after the match ended and was just holding it on longer and then china putting uh her hands on diane hart smith who uh, jumped the rail and came and trying to get sean off of british bulldog and so those were like the crimes that were committed against the Hart foundation mentioned earlier and from there we go um they keep showing this throughout the night um but it's just like a video footage like a um security video of the back door of the building or whatever and they commentary reference that they're um wait watching for uh stone cold to arrive so they know that he's here or whatever and that they can bring him out or whatever to talk to him and stuff and so throughout the night it keeps flashing back to that but i don't think i say every time but i just want to let you know it happens multiple times throughout the night until he shows up we then get into our first match of the night which is the british bulldog versus vader and throughout the mat or like as the matches start and stuff jerry the king along keeps uh commenting on vader's size you know like if he gets any bigger type thing um so they're commenting on size which i know was a uh, big part of vader stuff that he was getting overweight and st or even more than what he was and that they were trying to get him the slim down stump but in the match um they're fighting outside and uh british bulldog does um the thing where he like picks vader up i don't know like how you'd call what he did but he picks him up and then drops him down on top of the guardrail so like vader's you know like neck or chest slams against the guardrail um that they have and they do this um they do this twice so they do that and then they fight a little bit more it goes commercial and it comes back and when they're coming back from commercial they go they're um fighting their way back outside they go over to the exact same spot and B British Bulldog goes to do it again. But as he's picking Vader up to do it, Vader ends up countering and then he does it to British Bulldog. So they just do the same type of move to each other. And then back in the ring, uh, Vader ends up hitting um, the Vader bomb. Yeah, hitting the Vader bomb. But as he's pinning British Bulldog, Owen Hart comes running in to break it up. So because of that, um, Vader ends up winning by disqualification. And then all of the Hart Foundation ends up coming out. They start ganging up on Vader. And Brett ends up putting the figure four um, on Vader around the ring post like he's been doing. Which again just adds more torque and can injure you easily or whatever. And stuff. And while that's going on the Patriot ends up running out and you know helping Vader. And so the multiple numbers or whatever. The Hart Foundation end up getting the upper hand. And then Brett puts the figure four on him around the ring post again. Or also whatever. And then um, at the very end as the Hart Foundation end up beating out Patriot and Vader and they're laying in the ring the Heart Foundation takes their Canadian flags and just lays them over the top of the Vader and Patriot stuff and so it just ends with them being covered in the Canadian flags. From there we move on to our second match of the night which is um, Farouk who ends up coming out with the uh, Nation of Domination and he's going against Ahmed Johnson who comes out with the Legion of Dune and Ken Shamrock so they come out you know, with, or he comes out with the group to help counter the Nation of Domination. And this is for the Intercontinental Tournament. And so, um, as Ahmed's coming out, you can uh, first notice in commentary mentions it, how his hand is all wrapped up and they talk about the injury he got from uh, the last week that I mentioned that he cut his hand on something that was bleeding and everything. Well, it turns out that I guess when he um, was thrown out of the ring, he like kind of like rolled when he hit the ground and hit or like fell or whatever, rolled against the announce table when he did that he put his hand up to you know block or whatever well i guess when he did that his hand went onto an exposed nail and it went through his hand and so i guess he ended up um, having a lot of problems with that and he's like lost the ability to use like two fingers or something like that and stuff and so it's pretty nasty and so they said that he you know has his hand bandaged up to get through this match or whatever and then i don't know if then through um bad blood where they have the actual final match of the tournament um so i don't know if they're doing that or if he's uh gonna get it done between this raw and the pay-per-view or what but they mentioned that it's he's gonna get it fixed or whatever soon 
But then the match starts, and so from the very beginning, Ahmed Johnson starts attacking uh, Farouk. So again, because obviously with their feud going on and stuff, Farouk starts then, of course, attacking the injured head of hand of Ahmed Johnson, as you would with a injured body part. But then they're fighting to the outside, and Ahmed uh, picks up the ring steps, and so he hits Farouk with the steps. And of course, as he's doing this, the referee's out there, and he's trying to stop Ahmed Johnson from you know hitting Farouk and stuff. And in the process, Ahmed ends up hitting the referee. So because of that he gets disqualified and so um Farouk ends up winning by DQ and then th because of that all hell breaks loose in the ring so everybody just gets in the ring they start fighting and the good guys end up standing tall at the end so Ahmed, Legion of Doom, and Ken Shamrock are in the ring at the very end. From there we get another laser tag commercial with Sable and this time Sable's going against the headbangers and she ends up doing some weird trick thing or something and they ended up shooting each other and stuff to take each other out. It was just kind of stupid commercial. But from there we get another um, little preview or promo or video or something of Brian Pillman's X-Files and so this time it's of Brian Pillman and Marlena in a bed together and Marlena's of course covering up with sheets and stuff and Brian Pillman keeps like trying to pull on him, pull them off of her and she just keeps holding on and stuff. But he says that he will not fight uh, Do Love at Bad Blood because Gold Dust and so that to be actually actually be in the match he wants to be, have protection from Goldust and so his idea to do that is to have Goldust handcuffed at ringside so we're gonna have Goldust handcuffed at ringside so he doesn't interfere but as you could imagine with that I assume he will I don't remember exactly what happens but I assume he ends up either getting free or ends up getting a hold of Pillman at some point. Oh wait, no he does not because I remember what happens. I forgot that Pillman dies right before the pay-per-view so they don't actually have the match. So I forgot that the match never actually takes place and so that kind of brings this whole story to a very sad end and we'll talk about that next week I'm sure. Um, next up, Dude Love ends up coming out and he comes out and sits at commentary to be there for the match of or the next match which is Goldust. So he's there in support of Goldust and he's there or Goldust is taking on the Sultan who comes out with the Iron Sheet. And so um, when Goldust ends up coming out, he has half his face paint. So he's got face paint on half his face and then it's just Dustin R Reynolds or whatever you want to call him on the other side. Um, but his face paint is like a skeleton is what it looks like. So it's just kind of a new face paint going on there. Um, so as the match is going on, um, the commentary is talking with Dude Love and everything at the table and the, it's mentioned that Goldust gets a no DQ match with Brian Pillman if Dude Love ends up beating Brian Pillman at Bad Blood but as I said that doesn't end up happening so we don't get that but they do announce that that's going to happen and then back in the match Goldust just ends up hitting the Sultan with I think it was a, just a bulldog um he hits him with that and then is able to get the pin off that so he doesn't even hit him with a finish or anything uh then we do so as I mentioned earlier we have the footage of the back door of the building waiting for Stone Cold well now we actually get Stone Cold arriving at the building and he's yelling or whatever at the security stand at the door and stuff like that and from there we go into hour two and so it kicks off with Stone Cold coming out and uh he ends up calling Vince McMahon into the ring and Stone Cold uh, just tells Vince to go ahead and fire him so he's saying just saying a whole bunch of stuff about you know you should just fire or you could just go ahead and fire me and stuff like that and Vince says that um he's tired of putting officials in harm's way of Stone Cold because obviously Stone Cold just keeps stunning them and attacking him and stuff and that you know he's just doing it to try and protect Stone Cold and so he says he's gonna give Stone Cold three options and the first one is to present a paper from a doctor showing that he's cleared the wrestle which he says, you know, no doctor's gonna clear you. Number two is that Stone Cold returns the wrestle and he can do whatever he wants, but he must sign a liability waiver type thing so that if he gets injured further that he can't come back on the WWF and sue or come back for money, whatever. And the third option would be termination so that he does get fired. And uh, Stone Cold says that if Vince fires him that um, he will beat Vince's ass on Raw or whatever in front of the entire world. And so he says that um, if he does bring a paper from a doctor or the liability thing, or I think it is the liability, that maybe he'll sign it maybe he won't or if he uh that maybe he'll sign it or maybe he'll shove it up Vince's ass so again going using more stronger language and just kind of signifying a beating Vince up type thing and then so they end the thing Vince goes back to commentary and Stone Cold's in the ring you know just raising hell saying random stuff yelling at Vince and everything he gets out on the ring or on the outside the ring and he goes over and starts like hammering on the bell so with the little um get, picks up the bell hammer thing and starts hitting the bell like the the whatever the per just the person that rings but I forget what they're called um but then he takes the hammer from the bell and just throws it at Vince so of course 
Vince uh, gets a angry look on his face, like, what the hell are you doing type thing. And he comes over to commentary and then just double flips the birds into uh, Vince McMahon's face. Then next up, we get a match of the Headbangers, which of course are the tag team champions. And they're going against the Los Bariquas and it's Jose and Jesus of the Los Bariquas. So in the match, there's not really much that goes on. So at one point, um, the Headbangers end up hitting a flapjack on Jose. And as I said, the match is just pretty boring. So nothing much happens. Um, Jose does a Hurricane Rana onto Mosh off the top rope. So that was a kind of cool thing. And you have to remember the Los Bariquas, they're all kind of big men. They're all like heavier set guys. So it's kind of cool seeing some one of them do like Hurricane Rana stuff. Um, but after he does that, or the Jose does that. He goes for the pin, but um, the Godwins end up running out to interfere, and so the Los Bariquas end up winning by disqualification. And right after that, then the rest, the other two Los Bariquas, I forget what their name, um, Miguel and probably or Savio, I think are the two. They then come running in and they chase off the Godwins from the match. So it's just all tag teams fighting in to get each other or amongst each other, whatever going on. Um, from there, we then get a replay of the Ahmed Johnson attack on Farouk, and that we. We will, then they mention uh, that we'll get Farouk versus Owen Hart at Bad Blood for the Intercontinental Championship. And then that goes to Vince back in the ring for an interview and he's talking or brings out Owen Hart who obviously comes out with security he's got like um security people in like big bulletproof vests and helmets like SWAT gear almost and so he's talking about uh, Owen's talking he's just saying that um he will beat Farouk because he's the better wrestler and that Vince McMahon needs the fire Stone Cold because you know Stone Cold's a disgrace to the WWF and what um his father built as in Vince McMahon senior like what he built and stuff that Stone Cold's just a disgrace to the entire company in name of the WWF and so the thing ends Owen gets up on the ring you know or on the turnbuckles like celebrating or whatever he's doing Vince is starting to get out of the ring and then it's weird because the way they shoot it you then see over at the very edge of the screen you see a head just sitting there and it's stone cold and he's in the security outfit and the, so then I think later on we then get a re, like a replay or look back at it from a different camera angle and he obviously was one of the security guys and as Owen's getting up on the turnbuckle he takes the helmet off and jumps into the ring and then they do the thing where Owen gets down and stone Stone Cold goes over, attacks him, hits him with the stunner, and then probably starts yelling in his face, whatever, like he does. And then he slinks out of the ring and goes running off through the crowd as security um, is chasing him. And so Stone Cold escapes once again. And then uh, we go to commercial and come back, and it's showing a camera back in the locker room of Owen Hart laying on the stretcher and Jim Neidhart is standing over watching him, like guarding him or whatever from Stone Cold possibly coming back. And from there we go into our main event for the night, which is Triple A who ends up coming out with the other DX members and he's going against the Undertaker and so as Undertaker's coming out uh, Bret Hart and British Bulldog end up running out and attack Undertaker so they pretty much take him out before the match even starts well somewhat take him out and then because of that Vader and the Patriot end up running out and they start fighting with Bret and British Bulldog and they're fighting with each other and they end up fighting to the back and so once they get back to the curtain or whatever Triple H and Shawn Michaels run up and start attacking Undertaker on the ramp but as you would admit imagine Undertaker ends up getting the upper hand and then he chases Shawn Michaels into the ring and Shawn, uh, Triple H ends up following them to the ring or whatever and Shawn Michaels escapes and so since they're both in the ring the bell sounds whatever and the match officially starts and so throughout the match Undertaker does a choke slam on Triple H and then instead of pinning him he's just standing there watching Shawn Michaels and makes you know Shawn doesn't run in or whatever to attack him from behind and then Undertaker picks up Triple H to go for the tombstone but as he does Rick Rude comes in from behind with his briefcase and hits Undertaker on the back with it and so because that Undertaker gets the win by disqualification so they take Undertaker out or whatever and then all the DX members end up coming in and Rick Rude opens the briefcase and pulls out a body bag and so they lay it in the ring roll the Undertaker inside of it and zip it up and then um, they all start posing you know doing the DX crotch top thing and stuff just posing on turnbuckles well the Undertaker sips, sits up and starts ripping the bag open and then DX and Undertaker just start fighting with each other and they're fighting their way up the ramp and as uh, Sean starts to like you know run to try and escape he goes through the curtain or he opens up the curtain but when he does there's just a red light in there and it like smoke starts like pouring out of it and stuff so I would assume symboling like canes coming or something but Sean does that he starts like you know waving his hand in front of his face like trying to clear the smoke out and so he turns around a different direction while he's doing that Undertaker and Triple H are fighting and Undertaker gets Triple H and does a tombstone 
tombstone on him on top of the ramp. And as he's doing that, Shawn Michaels starts climbing up the side of the Titantron frame and um, just trying to escape the Undertaker climbing up it. And that's how Raw goes off of the air. And then from there we go into Nitro, and again it's Nitro 107 from September 29th, 1997. And this took place in Worcester, or Worcester, whatever you want to call it, Massachusetts. So of course to start off the show, we immediately start with a Nitro Girls segment dancing, and so they're dancing on the ramp. And then it goes over to commentary, and they're talking about the, they're just discussing the matches that are going to take place at Halloween Havoc. And then that leads into our first match, which is Buff Bagel, who ends up coming out with Vincent. And he's taking on Diamond Dallas Page. And so, first thing I noticed as uh, the matches get right started is that DDP is super popular. Everyone's just chanting DDP and holding up the diamond sign or whatever hand thing. And so, it just shows you how popular DDP was, even though he wasn't, you know, a Hulk Hogan or Ric Flair or anybody like that getting pushed really hard, that he was just a very popular guy. And of course, as the match starts, we get Buff Bagwell doing his usual stuff where after every time he hits a move he just starts posing and doing weird stuff as he does. And then throughout the match it's shown Raven sitting at ringside and so again it just shows you to show that you know at some point he's going to get involved or some sort of thing in the show which I don't really know if he ever does. But then like it's, the camera starts to zoom out from his face and you just see Stevie Richards sitting behind him in the crowd and he's got like a huge smile on his face and so it was just really cheesy and stuff but it just shows them sitting there. Uh, then back in the ring uh, Buff Bagwell ends up uh, selling a knee injury uh, to try and get the upper hand so he's like holding his leg and freaking out and stuff and so the referee's pushing Diamond House Page away to, so he can you know check on him and stuff to make sure his knee's okay or whatever but of course Baff, uh, Bagwell's just faking or whatever and so he gets up and low blows Diamond Dallas Page and pins him with the feet on his ro or with his feet up on the rope and stuff but Page is able to kick out of it and then uh, Diamond Dallas Page is able to roll Bagwell up while he was arguing with the ref about the whole pinfall and stuff and Diamond Dallas Page in, or Buff Bagwell ends up kicking out of it and then at one point Buff ends up uh, pushing Diamond Dallas Page into the referee knocking the ref out of the ring and so because of that Vincent ends up coming in the ring and they start double teaming on Diamond and Dallas Page and then Page hits uh, Vincent followed then by Buff Bagwell with the diamond cutter and then of course is able to get the pinfall on Buff Bagwell because the ref's coming back too at that point and then Diamond Dallas Page ends up exiting through the crowd and he jumps over the railing and he does it right where Raven is sitting so they just kind of do a stare down with each other and you know Raven's moved aside whatever and DDP walks up through the crowd and then Raven sits back down in his chair. Uh, next up we then get a little like commercial or segment type thing on a sort of like report type thing Mike Tenay's doing in it um he did like a whole trip to Mexico where he learned all about uh luchadors and so it's going to be a weekly series coming up starting the next week I would imagine and it talks about how uh he's gonna talk like learn about um luchador like in their history of the mask their training their lifestyle where they grew up and just all sorts of stuff about the luchadors and um just like the history of luchadors and stuff and then that fittingly leads into our next match of Rey Mysterio Jr. and he's taking on someone called El Caliente which is a guy in a mask but you can kind of easily tell by the body and the way he wrestles and everything that it's Eddie Guerrero but to start off the match Rey Mysterio starts to like go outside to give a mask to a kid like he's been doing but as he's doing that he gets attacked by a mask wrestler who ends up being his opponent as again as I said you can tell it's Eddie Guerrero and so I'm just calling gonna call him Eddie instead of El Caliente uh, but Eddie tries to like throughout the matches keep trying to take Rey Mysterio's mask off and he's like untying the strings on the back of it that are tied you know to keep it on and stuff and of course the crowd's able to figure out that it's Eddie Guerrero and stuff and so they start uh, doing chants of Eddie sucks and then at one point Eddie ends up hitting the superplex off the top rope and starts to go up for his um, frog splash um, but ends up stopping because like, I took it as you know he's going up for it but he's like oh no if I do this people are going to know it's me Eddie Guerrero so he stops and um, just starts attacking Ray again but Ray is end up um, ends up getting the win off the a double springboard that he does into a Hurricane Rana so the Hurricane Rana is kind of like his uh, um, finisher it seems like 
And then after he beats Eddie, he then, uh, Rey Mysterio then goes and takes the mask off of El Caliente to reveal that it was Eddie Guerrero the whole time. Next up, we get Mean Gene coming out for an interview on the ramp with the Giant. And then Giant just mentions that, um, you know, he has a match tonight with Kurt Henning. And then just says, you know, for the NWO, payback is hell. It's pretty much all it is there. That for, uh, Kurt Henning, payback is hell for what he did to, um, Ric Flair and stuff. Uh, then from there, it's like starting to go to commercial, but like it's, you know, starting to like cut out or something, but then it comes back real quick and commentary's like, what's going on and stuff? And it shows Ring St uh, Sting standing up in the crowd, like up in the upper sections and stuff, just standing there and stuff. So it shows that Sting is in the building and then it goes to commercial and comes back and we get into our next match of Barbarian, who's taking on Bill Goldberg. Um, so again, they're talking about Goldberg, how he pulled off a win, you know, last week for his first match and stuff and that might how Mike today didn't have any information to provide on him and he still uh, doesn't have much um, but then the match starts and so um, again there's not a whole lot important or big that happens in it except for it's just so weird watching Goldberg at this stage because he's actually doing like wrestling moves and stuff and so uh, at one point Goldberg does like an arm bar takedown like it's not an arm bar but that's exactly what it looks like but takedown maneuver and like just kind of like rolls Barbarian up and stuff. Um, he ends up doing a drop kick on Barbarian, which sends Barbarian over the top rope to the floor. And then as you'd imagine, he ends up hitting the jackhammer for the win. So this is win number two for him. And then as he's, of course, walking up the ramp, Mean Gene comes out to try and get an interview with him. And Goldberg just stands there for a few seconds and then walks away. And uh, Mean Gene ends up holding a picture up of Goldberg. And he's in like football uniform. He mentions that he was a Georgia Bulldog football player and then I think maybe mentions that he was a professional football player or something but I don't remember exactly and then from there immediately goes in with Minji being out there already he start calls out Larry Zabisco for an interview um and Zabisco mentions that he's in the match with Scott Hall and Lex Luger how he's gonna be the referee that he's gonna be fair and down the middle and that the worst thing he could do to Scott Hall you know because he's trying to figure out how to get back at him that he's like the worst thing I could possibly do to Scott Hall is to make him have a, a match you know with the rules and everything where he has to abide by everything and that he would actually have to wrestle instead of, you know, having other people do stuff for him or do cheat tactics and stuff. From there, we get another Nitro Girls dance segment in the ring this time. And then commentary mentions that we will get a um, phone call from Ric Flair tonight and he'll talk about um, his future and what's going to happen with him later on. And then we go into our next match of Juventud Guerrero who takes on Disco Inferno. And so um, in the match, uh, at one point, Disco ends up getting Hoovy up for a powerbomb, but ends up dropping him backwards onto the top rope instead of, you know, obviously for throwing him down um, face to, onto the ring or whatever, he ends up just dropping him backwards over onto the top rope, so I thought that looked kind of cool. Um, Alex Wright ends up coming out to ringside, and as Disco is pinning Hooventude, Alex ends up uh, reaching in and putting Hooventude's leg up on the rope to break the pin, and then Miss Jackie or Jacqueline ends up coming out um, to ringside, and they she just starts arguing with Alex Wright. And in the match, Jackie ends up tripping Hooventude as he's bouncing off the ropes, which then trips him up and allows Disco to do a move on him to get the win. So Disco ends up winning. And then he gets out, and of course, Jackie and Alex are like coming up to himself. And he's like, I don't have time to deal with this or something like that. And he just goes walking off, and Alex and Jackie end up arguing. And you can hear that they're saying over who will get to face Disco for the championship. So again, leading to the match, I believe it, Jackie ends up um, facing Disco at one point. And that goes into hour two, and so it kicks off with Macho Man coming out with Miss Elizabeth, and they um, he just comes out on the ramp and cutting the promo, and he just war um, starts off by warning uh, Roddy Piper not to get too creative with the match at Halloween Havoc, and then he challenges uh, Sting to come and face him after the match or during the match or something at Halloween Havoc. He says if Sting's there, he can come out and face me or something like that, and then that leads into our next match of Jeff Jarrett, who comes of course comes out with Deborah and taking on Steve. McMichaels um, and so of course as the match is starting there's a lot of Jarrett uh, sucks chants and then um, the match of course picking up and everything and commentary is mentioning how uh, Deborah and Steve McMichaels have separated and that they're each living alone so they're you know like going through their divorce or whatever uh, then at one point or at one point in the match Steve McMichaels is laying against the bottom rope and as he's doing Deborah comes up and he, she just starts pulling on his ponytail and you know just doing whatever that does hurting him or whatever she can from the outside uh, then at one point Steve McMichaels gets Jeff Jarrett up for to do the tombstone but Jarrett ends up countering and then he starts 
working over Mongo's leg, Mongo Steve McBuy, I don't know whatever you want to call him, but starts uh, working over his leg to put on the figure four, but Mongo ends up uh, being able to counter it and stuff, and then Jarrett ends up attacking him from behind while Mongo is distracted with Deborah, and then rolls him up and puts his feet up on the ropes to get the pin. Next up is a Nitro Girls dance segment on the ramp. Leading into our next match of Six who comes out with Scott Hall and he's taking on Chris Jericho. And so when Six and Scott Hall come out, you notice that Scott Hall's coming out on crutches. And they mentioned that he was injured, got injured last week or was injured over the weekend or something. And again, it starts out with a little promo and Scott Hall like does the pull on the crowd again seeing people are here to see the NWO or WCW and the crowd overwhelmingly cheers for NWO. And then um, what again, the, the show starts to go to commercial but Scott Hall, you know, ends up stopping and saying that uh, they're not going to go commercial or whatever until I say they can or whatever. And so he ends up saying, talking about the match coming up at Halloween Havoc, saying that if Larry Zabisco doesn't call the match, you know, down the middle, like he says, that um, Hall will end up attacking him and putting Zabisco on the shelf. And then the match actually starts and Chris Jericho once again comes out to his uh, WWF music instead of the ma uh, music used to come out with t on WCW. So then throughout the match at one point Six ends up hitting the Bronco Riot or Bronco Buster whatever you want to call it onto Chris Jericho of course sitting in the corner but then Jericho's able to get the under upper hand and he ends up doing what they call the Lionheart swing so it's just the big swing but they add Lionheart onto the front of it and then uh, Chris Jericho ends up hitting the Lion Salt and then starts to put the Lion Tamer onto Six but Scott Hall gets up on the apron causing a distraction and as Chris Jericho is going over to deal with Scott Hall Six comes up from behind and puts the ki Buzz Killer on which is just a cross face chicken wing and so Six has Chris Jericho held in that and then Scott Hall gets in and he starts harassing the ref and has the ref pinned up against the turnbuckle and he has like his uh, crutch pin like held up against him and stuff and because of that Larry Zabisco ends up coming out to the ring and uh, he pulls six off of Chris Jericho and so he's there you know like challenging like you know saying come at me and stuff to six and scott hall but luger ends up running out and backing up larry zabisco and they just stare down hall and six who end up leaving the ring from there it goes into the phone call with rick flair and so rick flair starts it off by saying uh you know thank you for um tony shivani for the thing kind things he said about rick flair the past weeks and stuff and being concerned for him and then he actually thanks Kurt Henning and he says, you know, it's weird that I'm saying this, but he goes, I'm thanking him because he gave me a wake up call on uh, being complacent in WCW and not being exactly what he should be and being the man and stuff. And he's uh, saying that he's going to come back for his robe and that Hulk Hogan will regret taking his robe, you know, that Kurt Henning gave to him. And then he kind of makes the big announcement that Chris Benoit and Steve McMichaels have been released from the Four Horsemen because he doesn't, um, that he wants them to be successful out on their own and not have to worry about, you know, taking care of Ric Flair, watching his back and stuff anymore. So the Four Horsemen has like been disbanded or whatever and then he puts the nwo on notice that when he comes back he's gonna come out for the nwo and after each one of them and stuff and that they're just put on notice and then from there something kind of interesting we get our first nitro party video and so the people that did this video are actually in the crowd sitting ringside and it's a bunch of uh, graduate students from Brown University, so it's a whole bunch of like doctors and stuff along those type lines. And they're all like course wearing white lab coats, and so it shows them like their video and stuff of like a house or some kind of place, and they're in the living room with a whole bunch of people watching Nitro. And then of course it shows them sitting at ringside, they're all wearing like lab coats and everything. Um, and <laughs> at the very end, Bobby Heenan, which is you know funny and stuff, just showing a part of stuff he says, um, he ends up saying. What, there's a school named after James Brown, the soul legend or soul king of soul or whatever and stuff? And of course, commentator just starts laughing, laughing and saying, you know, what Brown University actually is. So just showing you some of Bobby Heenan's quick wit and funny stuff he says. And then Eric Bischoff ends up coming out to the ring to cut a promo. And he just talks about Sting and stuff, and he calls Sting a Muppet at one point, or multiple points, I guess. And that uh, every time Sting ends up showing up on Nitro or whatever stuff is when Hulk Hogan isn't here. And so, like he did tonight, Hulk Hogan isn't there because he's filming a new movie, or at, it's, I think they said he's in France doing something. Um, but so once again, showing that Sting is a coward. And then he moves on to the match with um, Piper at Halloween Havoc. And he's saying that Hulk Hogan will rip Piper's leg off and then shove it down Piper's throat. And so just showing that saying you know he's gonna end up beating Roddy Piper. And that he uh, challenges Sting to show up at Halloween Havoc. 
is pretty much all it is and then he leaves we get an nwo commercial for and they're selling buff bagwell's hat so whatever that weird hat thing he wears there it's a commercial for that and i think it says nwo on it and stuff which then moves into our next match of wrath who comes out with james vandenberg versus lex luger so there's not much really that goes on it's kind of a boring match but uh, uh, Vandenberg at one point ends up grab grabbing onto Lex Luger's leg as he's bounced off the rope as managers tend to do. <laughs> That's like a most common maneuver that they do. Uh, there's a lot of Luger sucks chance so it's just showing you that uh, even though a while ago Lex Luger was like very popular and like super overly cheered but now they're all chanting that he sucks. Uh, then at one point Wrath ends up hitting the diving clothesline off the top rope which he's been doing a lot at, but in the end Lex Luger ends up uh, hitting the double clothesline a power slam and then puts Wrath up in the torture rack to get the win. And then from there we get our last Nitro Girl segment of the night. So they're dancing up on the ramp and then they move into the aisle way where they're dancing. And while this is going on, Eric Bischoff ends up coming out to commentary like sneaks up on commentary. And so Bobby Heenan and Mike Tanay end up leaving. So it's Bischoff and Tony Schiavone. And then that leads into our main event for the night, which is Kurt Henning versus the Giant for the U.S. Championship. And so, of course, as the match starts, Kurt Henning is selling really big for the Giant. So every time Giant hits him, he takes a really big bump and just get, is getting thrown around the ring. At one point, Kurt Henning's like up in the turnbuckle or kind of like how you'd sit for like a stink face or the bronco buster and stuff but the giant comes walking over and just sits on top of um, kurt henning's chest in the corner and stuff but then towards the end of the match kurt henning does end up getting the fisherman suplex hit on the giant but the giant actually miraculously kicks out because i haven't seen anyone kick out of that move yet and then he um the giant gets up and picks up kurt henning and hits him with the choke slam but as he's you know getting ready to go for the pin the nwo all come running out and they all just start attacking him and so the giants in the ring um fighting all of the nwo off but of course they're able to get the upper hand and so a bunch of them just grab like body parts of the giant and are holding him and scott horton has the u.s title and uh just hits a uh, giant in the back of the head knocking him out or whatever and because that sting comes walking down the aisle way or whatever with the bat and he gets in just starts clearing the ring and so he's hitting people with the bat and then i think he ends up dropping it or something and then just starts fighting people off with the hands and it's just him fighting off the nwo to end out the night so that was it for nitro 107 this week so like i said that was nitro and raw from september 29th 1997 both again pretty decent shows um like i said they're pretty decent much better than of course current modern day wwe and stuff like that but they're both really good but again i probably would have to go with raw for this one but again i usually go with raw so that's why i can't like sit here and judge or tell you which one is better because i'm biased towards raw and unless Nit like i will say if nitro's good and stuff but i just like this one especially i thought raw was a lot better but yeah like i said they're both pretty good and decent this week and so that's gonna be it for the monday night rewind this week so again you can find us here on youtube at awesome nerd show and then on itunes or apple podcasts and soundcloud under monday night rewind podcasts or monday night rewind in the podcast section so you can subscribe and download on there you can also sit on um, the Apple podcast leave reviews and star ratings and stuff so you could do that for me if you want to but don't forget most of all here on YouTube to subscribe to the channel to catch all videos so if you would especially on YouTube there be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed leave any comments you have down below and hit that red subscribe button to check out all videos and never miss an episode every week of the Monday Night Rewind podcast do all that for me and we'll see you next time